it's still a good morning. <laughs> so I think I think I figured out what's going on. Every time I schedule a Twitter space and then try to start it up, it acts up. But if I just start one right on the fly, it seems to be fine. So I guess if we do any more space between now and November 11th, it'll just have to be one of those guerrilla attacks where you just don't know when it's coming and there is a spring on you. <laughs> I hope you're doing all all very well this fine Saturday morning. Hope you're safe and in good spirits. I am admittedly a little tired. Uh, I stayed up all last night working on some things in my writings. Getting prepared because we're getting real, real close to that one million mark on to, uh, on YouTube, which is insane. At the time of this Twitter space, I'm at 877,000 followers, which is absolutely incredible. And it's it's really intimidating when I think about it. It's a lot of a lot of folks all around the world listening to some I you know, talk about things that can change their entire legacy and family tree in terms of financial. The topic this morning, admittedly, I had a hard time finding something to talk about, and it probably sounds strange, but I've been preoccupied since last Friday with following along the events and listening to people that actually are over there in Israel and in Gaza. I have students from both groups, and both of them want me to talk about things and you know defend each side. So I'm going to make a blanket statement here in two sentences, and then that's all I'm going to say about it, okay? <clears throat> what you are doing is prophesied. I don't have an answer for it, and I pray for both of you to stop because there's children that are suffering. You know, adults, they can make these decisions to to war. But the children don't have that. They're taught to do these things. And it's both sides. So that's my statement on it. But the uh, the topic this morning came to mind when I thought about my son. Where as a new trader, Maybe as a new student, someone that's trying to dabble into technical analysis and trading and seeing who has what that is appropriate for them. Because not everything that I teach is going to be appropriate for everyone. And for for most of you, you know, when you come in, if you ever listen to anybody else teach or talk about the markets, as soon as I drop the the idea or suggest the idea or make the case that there is 100% manipulation and control of the markets and it's algorithmic. And before electronic trading became a thing, it was a group of men that actually controlled price and they worked, they, they're the real market makers. Um, when it was automated and turned to electronic format, there are scripts that run. And I don't know why it's so hard for people to accept this, but, but I understand that it goes against... The grain that's been established in this industry because so many people have titles and so many people have you know, accolades that were given because of whatever they've done and they attribute it to previous archaic ideas that the markets are buying and selling pressure or supply and demand factors. And it's not. It's manipulation, control, sentiment, and unseating those individuals for the purposes of fleecing them and taking their position over and them taking the money. So that's really what it's all about. It's war. It's warfare, basically, and deception. So if you understand going into that, it's not shocking. It's it it disarms you, so that way you come in with the right mindset, so that way you're not worrying about uh, your system being perfect. You're more concerned about not falling a victim to what is predominantly used against retail thought. But as a new trader, as a new student, or someone that's trying to do it, it's really easy to get motivated in the beginning. Seeing other people show you their results, seeing students getting interviewed and talking about how empowered they feel and taking money out of the marketplace and being able to spend it 
not to simply have some kind of market replay report, which you can't spend money on, or a demo account, which you know, we're not paying taxes on demo. And you can't pay your bills on that. You can't pay your bills and take your spouse or significant other over to a nice restaurant once a month and not think too much of it because of a paper or tape reading event. Those results, they don't pay the bills. So when you finally get to the point where you want to try to do this and you feel motivated, a strange thing takes place when you're out there watching price action live. And when you know there's a likelihood of a big news driver coming out, something you know that we call a volatility injection, which is a red folder event on the calendar. You can use the Econo Day or you can use the Forex Factory calendar. I use those interchangeably. Um, but going back years and years and years ago, um, before Forex was available to us as traders, um, Econo Day and the equivalent was always the economic calendar everybody went to. But I like the format for Forex Factory because it was easy for me to snatch those and share them as a screenshot to students when I was just, just teaching predominantly the Forex market. Well, when we have these motivations in the beginning as a, as a new interested party in, in speculation, learning how to trade, learning how the market's book price and how to engage it and try to seek a pattern, a model, an approach, a trading plan, something to get you into a trade help you manage it, control your impulses, aiming for a result that is hopefully gainful at the end. And if not, not as much of a painful loss that would be so debilitating, it would remove your interest or remove the motivation. But when you are watching real time, live price action, whether it's tape reading, whether it's demo trading, whether it's trading uh, a combine and trying to get a funded account passed or trading a funded account or live your money at risk. It's a weird phenomenon that takes place where all the motivation that led up to you wanting to do this. Now you're here. You're at the, you're at the, you're at the dance now. Okay. You're, 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 you're sitting there and you're watching price action in real time. You're not studying it in hindsight and back testing. You are now met with the uncertainty of that hard right edge, and you don't know where it's going to go. And if you subscribe to an opinion, that opinion may be challenged immediately as soon as you associate it to whatever you see in the charts. And that motivation sometimes can become impulse. Everything that you try to do in the beginning that leads you into the idea of pursuing profitability. This is your career. This is your secondary income. This is your retirement plan. This is your get rich program, whatever it is. All of you are going to have different views about why you're doing this. You want to impress your in-laws. <laughs> I always found that in, uh, very amusing when uh, in 1995, I heard Larry Williams you talk about that. That's when he would do seminars you know, live events where people would be there and he's teaching them, they would send out a questionnaire in the beginning. And then, you know, what are you trading for? Like, what, wh why are you trading? And he said, it was fun to read a lot of the responses and people would say like, you know, to, to prove to my mother-in-law, I was, you know, really worth it for their daughter to be married to him. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, all of us have these secondary reasons to get in. And, you know, yeah, I, I had that, you know, that's the, that's the real reason why I got into it. And that's why it made it made me laugh when I first heard it, but also was pulling back in the as an audience of one watching his VHS tape in 1995. It made me feel uncomfortable because he nailed me right there, because that's why I started trading. The whole reason why I started and pursuing it was I wanted to be better and bigger than everybody else thought I would be or am. And as a young man, you know, you're very vulnerable. You're vulnerable to the, the effects of other people's opinions of you. And young men typically will act like they don't care and they'll raise up and they'll use colorful language and maybe even want to throw hands. 
because you've really just crushed them. And I was like that as a 20 year old, you know, I, I wanted to find success outside of the normal venues and routes that people take, you know, working as an employee going through college, you know, trying to be the good slave. And I, I don't have that. I've never really had that mindset. And it was very hard for me to try to subscribe to that view in the beginning, because it had, in my mind, it was a plan B. Like I was going to do everything I could to figure out how the markets work. But if I couldn't, at least I have a degree, at least I can go in. And at the worst case, I could be a programmer, worst case. But I was learning COBOL, CICS, Pascal, BASIC, C++. That was the highest at the time when I was going through. Now, did any of that help me get a job? No. Didn't help me get a job at all. And all the things that I started with as a motivation, like I'm going to be a, a systems analyst. I'm going to be a consultant for companies and I'm going to have my own firm. That was my plan. I didn't want to be a, you know, an IT specialist or a, a computer programmer, someone working for a company. My motivation was always, I'm going to have my own place, my own thing. I'm going to call the shots for myself because I don't want other people telling me what I want to do. So I was motivated. And what's weird is, is I was never impulsive at all in my decision making while going through the required lessons, classes, getting the credits, working towards a degree that would, in my mind, I thought it was going to, you know, who wouldn't want someone with computer science and specializing in business management? Who, I mean, if you think about that, I mean, I, like you got it, right? That's what my opinion was. And I was never impulsive. I was submissive to whatever. This is the prerequisites for this class. To get this, you got to do this. You got to do that. And trading wasn't even in my my, my thoughts. Like it, it wasn't there. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And because of circumstances, working for a Jewish family and owning some mills, and a chance opportunity to see a, a, a magazine that, I don't know, maybe I would have saw it on a, on a news rack somewhere. Uh, but I never really would have, in my mind, wanted to reach for Entrepreneur Magazine, you know, because you know, it's like anything else. It's most of it's advertisements. But it just happened that that magazine was laying on the desk in front of me. And I asked my then boss, I said, I said, Glenn, can, can I borrow this tonight? I'll bring it back. He's like, you have it. And you know the story that little classified ad in the back started the whole process of learning about commodities, which was coming now full circle because when I was 14, 15, and 16 years old, my uncle was telling me the richest people in the world trade futures and options. Get yourself a good job. He was pushing me to be an electronic technician. And I'm, I wasn't interested in that. And in sixth grade, I was making my own games. I was coding them. I would stay after school in the math class. And I would ask the teacher, my math teacher, I said, can I stay as long as you stay? And when you leave, I'll leave. Yep, no problem. And sometimes I would be lucky enough to be there till 6.30. Other days it would just be 30 minutes. And I'd walk home angry that I didn't get enough time to practice and use because I didn't have a computer. Like I didn't have one. So you know, these are all the days when we had the, the floppy disks. <laughs> <laughs> where you couldn't put anything on it. Like it was nothing. It was like literally no storage whatsoever. And the computers were just glorified calculators, right? But I was never impulsive about any of it. But I've always been a thousand percent in whatever I've been in. I've always been, you know, a thousand percent effort into it. But I was never really impulsive about any decision making that was associated with that career path. So I found it a little bit shocking. When looking at price as a 20-year-old and the, the potential to make a lot of money in a very short period of time and the sense of accomplishment that it might present to me, you know, it was a perfect storm where I'm entering a field brand new, 1992. I have no idea what's going on. No idea how to trade. 
I read one book that was basically a rag that just introduced something that was not even a method. Like I've presented you lots of concepts, but I've also given you specific models, how to use it, what time it's going to form, how to enter it, how to put your stop loss into it, how to add to it, where to target. That's a complete, absolute, no excuse. Now you know how to trade and you can apply it to any time frame. I didn't have that when I first started. I had, this is a head and shoulders pattern. This is a bull flag. This is a channel breakout. This is a wedge. This is a ascending triangle, descending triangle. And this is a, a broadening top and bottom uh, formation or megaphone pattern and trend lines. That that's what I that's what I came into trading commodities with. And the first step out of the gate in that race, impulse showed up. Why? I didn't know it then. I, I had no idea what. I was doing why I was even doing it at all. I completely lost the focus of what was the motivation for me to be there. I mean, it got me there. It got me to the point where I put money into a brokerage account. It got me to the point where I was willing to accept the pay $100 per contract, which they called full service commission. And as a new trader, it felt like they were going to protect me. And for the most part, they... They would just help you. You know, you're sure you want to go long. That means you're trying to make money as it goes up, right? Okay. Uh, do you want to use a stop loss? How much are you willing to risk? And they would help you determine. That was Fox Investments. Now, when you went with Lind Waldock or Ira Epstein or something to the equivalent, something where you know they expect you to know your orders. They didn't, they're not in there to handhold. Like they want to get your order and get off the phone. That's the way it was back then. We, we called in our orders. And some of you just don't understand what, what the, the gravity of that and how that would make it even more complex for you. Right now, you're all young. You're all fresh faces in this industry listening to me. And you're thinking, you know, what was that like? Yeah, it was, uh, it was something. <laughs> Not only did you have to be right and you had time to market, but you had to then time the market in a way where you were anticipating the setup because you knew when you called the broker, you got the front desk first, then you got to give them your, your desk number or letter. Since my last name was Huddleston, I was on the H desk. Okay, go to the H desk and you wait for them to pick up the phone. Usually within two rings, they pick up and then they tell you, okay, H desk, you know, what's your order? And you tell them your account number. And then you give them an access that says that you verifies who you are. It's kind of like a pin. And then they, you tell them what you want to do. And then they read the order back to you. The whole time, all of this is going on, the market's ticking around, up and down, up and down, maybe running away from you. And I had live cattle trades that did that. <laughs> it was like uh, they opened the gate and they all ran out. And you know, I was you know buying something. Way past the price I should I should have, but I was thinking, well, I'm not, I, you know, my motivation, my motivation told me that it, it, you know, I need to be on the phone calling the broker, and when he told me the price, because everything I was doing was market orders, market orders, in a move that I'm bullish and it's already started running, and the price he's telling me, literally, is four hundred dollars past where I'm trying to get in. My motivation became impulse. I had to be part of that move. It just confirmed that I was right about where it's going to go. And I was so willing to be part of it so I can claim I was right. I was willing to be placed in the trade at a very poor location. And I had to sit through a day of drawdown because I bought it at an inflated price. And then... My price was literally like four or five ticks away from the high of the day. And then it just receded back throughout the day. And I was watching on my Quotrek, which is a little handheld device. Not much, really about the same dimension of my Ultra 20 right now, which is a Samsung phone I use. I use Android because Apple sucks. The <laughs> For the folks who want to know why I think that, um, it, it just, 
I've had two phones where they failed on me and Apple would not go in and open a phone up for me so I can get my videos out. So I've lost several Christmases and birthdays and things that I filmed that I can't access. So that's why that's my beef with Apple. Okay. But now since I'm a Samsung user, uh, Android is better, way, way better. But uh, the, the same dimension size of the phone I'm using, can't wait to get rid of on November 12th. Uh, the the size and dimension of this is almost equivalent to what a Quotrek was. I and mean, Quotrek was a little bit bulkier. But what that was is a little device that had an extendable antenna on the top of it. And it would give us real-time quotes. It wasn't charts. It was just quotes. So I was learning in the same way that floor traders traded. Now, I didn't know that. I wasn't being trained with the idea that this is what you're doing, but you have to have a defined range of where the price was the previous day, the high and low. And then I would have ranges of what the morning session was the previous day, what the afternoon session high and low was, and then what was the last hour's high and low of trading before it closed, whatever market I was interested in. And those ranges I used to determine whether or not it was still favorable for me to enter. And I was only trying to be a buyer because I didn't understand shorting. But here I am. The broker's telling me, yeah, you know, live cattle's at this price now. And he confirms the order. You want to you be buying at this price, which is where we're at right now at market. And then they, you wait, they wait for you to confirm it. Yes. And then they say, okay, you want to hold for your confirmation? Yes. And they come back a minute or so. The whole time you're on the phone waiting, it's moving around now. Think about what you're witnessing in your in your charts live. From the time you feel like it's time for you to take the trade, then you got to find a payphone, get out of your vehicle, walk over to it. Hopefully, there's nobody in the payphone. Sometimes I had to wait, but my motivation that brought me to that trade. <sighs> Sometimes I offered the guy, look here. Yeah. Can I have can I have that phone? Here's 20 bucks. Please, I need to make this phone call. Yeah, sure. Here you go. <laughs> and then I lost money on trade. So it was at, you know, insult to injury, right? But motivation led to impulse. What does that mean? What, what's your point here, ICT? What are you getting at? The things that make you feel like you want to be able, willing to inviting the risks you don't respect that same measure of risk when now when you are really at that moment where you could still say no i'm not going to do it let me just let me sit still and not do it so your motivation leads you to the dance that means you're in front of the chart you're sitting there you're watching it you have your silver bullet in mind you have your optimal trade entry in mind you have you know whatever else i've ever taught that you've gravitated to as your model you have your draw on liquidity you believe it's going to go here or it's going to go there and you're ready to see it if it could just give you a fair value gap you're in there but then something magical happens <laughs> something magical comes in and changes Everything. It's like your perception completely changes and it becomes sometimes like a language you've never read before and you're, you're like a deer in headlights. You're paralyzed. You knew what you wanted to do. But now you're in front of the charts and you're watching life practice action and you can't do it. You're waiting for something to appear as a nudge, a little you're right, now take it. And many of us, when we first start, we call that confirmation. <laughs> the only thing that it confirms is you, you sat there too long. That's what it confirms. You sat there too long. Now it's already moved. It would be better for you to wait for some kind of a down close candle in a lower time frame, reach into a fair value gap if you're bullish, and then use that. Don't chase running higher price when you're bullish. Don't do it. Don't do it. Because the only thing you're doing is increasing the likelihood of your stop loss needing to be larger than it's necessary to be or making it harder for you to hold the trade because you're going to know as soon as you enter it, 
you're going to be demanding subconsciously that it moves right away in your favor and you don't want to see any kind of drawdown. Whereas if you're bullish, and this is how I teach, so it, it overcomes a lot of the built-in fears that are associated with being poorly placed in a trade or chasing price. So if you're bullish, I'm teaching you to buy what? A down close candle or a candle that's forming a likely down close candle, but it need not close down. It could be trading lower and still have a higher close. But at the time of your entry, if you're bullish, you're waiting for price to go lower into an inefficiency or run below a short term low to take those stops. So you're going to buy sell stops or buy inefficiency on a buy side imbalance, sell side inefficiency. You're going to buy that rebalancing to close up and overlap that up close candle that you're seeing as an inefficiency. So you're you're buying against the grain of price delivery versus impulsively chasing it. In the beginning, because you think as a trader, just like I did, I want to be in a market that has the market going up. Like I, I want to be in a move that's going up. It's too scary. I'm speaking hypothetically and in, in, in retrospect to how it was when I first started. So as a 20-year-old, I was afraid to buy things when it was moving lower. To me, it made no sense. I mean, it literally made no sense whatsoever, whatsoever to, to – to go in and try to pick a bottom. That's what I was looking at it as because I heard my mentor say, you know, you got to avoid trying to pick bottoms. They're like catching falling knives. You have to wait for that dagger to fall, hit the ground, stop quivering, then gingerly go over and pick it up. That's verbatim. That's literally right out of that Ford cassette tape VHS course that he had from 1995. It was ingrained in me, just like the things that I say to you as your mentor. I'm not in the room with you. But you will see something in the charts and you'll hear my voice saying the very thing that you had a resonation with in, in a video or a lecture, maybe something in this one today. And you'll hear my voice. You'll you'll know exactly what I said verbatim because it had a, it left an indelible mark on you. It, it made an impact on you psychologically. So, you know, you think differently as a result of it. In the beginning, when you have no real clue what you're doing, no model. You can become very impulsive, but as a new student with a model, with all the right motivation, you still can be impulsive. What does that mean? What, what does that mean? Now, what's, the, what's the contrast between what I've already said so far versus someone that now has a model, has all the right mindset, has listened to all the proper mindset from the inner circle trader and how to do this and how to do that. Now we're at the dance now. We're staring at the chart. It's during that 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock hour. We know that there's going to be a silver bullet. We know that it's likely going to draw to a liquidity pool that's pretty obvious where it's likely to go. But here you are, sitting there, looking at price. Give me one second. Go grab my water. I left it outside. <laughs> so when you have a model and you have all the proper motivation that led you up to the point where now you've made the decision, you went to sleep the previous day, you woke up with every expectation that you're going to go into this following the plan, following the model, following the rules. You're looking for this setup to form. And now you're here. You're in front of the charts. You're there. And you do what? You act impulsively. You see something that is not your model. Perfect example. I'll give you something. You've done the work. You've done the analysis. You've listened to me talk about what I think the market is going to likely draw to on a higher time frame. You committed to the idea that that's probably what you're going to subscribe to so you're only going to focus in that direction and that's the proper mindset not that you should be handheld but I, that's why i do it so that way you can keep your premise your bias the narrative focused on that time frame draw you won't be 100 percent, but now because you're in front of the charts 
subconsciously you're demanding that you're hundred percent. Is that practical? Is that realistic? Is that something that anyone could reasonably expect to have? Especially if they're new? No, of course not. But that motivation that carried you to that moment, where now you're in front of the charts, you're ready to do your model, you're ready to pull the trigger. All you have to do is wait for that fair value gap to form because it's going to be moving up quickly and it's going to create that little buy sign of balance, sell sign of efficiency. And it's going to form it in a place where it allows you to capture 12 to 15 handles. So that means your minimum criteria for the trade would be met. It's really there. But unfortunately, it's not there yet. And what happens is, is you start seeing price run. And in your mind, you're thinking, this is going to be one of those times where it's not going to create a fair value gap. And here I am. I, I did all the work. I got all this stuff drawn on my chart. I have all the lipstick. I have all the motivation. I'm here now. And I know what's going to happen because Murphy's Law says that whatever can go wrong is going to go wrong. And it's going to run without me. And I'm not going to be able to accept that because I've done all this preliminary analysis. I've done all this preliminary workup. Listening to this guy, Jawbone. I'm all I'm all pumped up. I'm ready to go. And here it's running. It just took off eight handles straight one shot. It's running. Your mind's going to be tricked by that because you haven't watched price enough. That motivation to do the right things gets replaced with impulsiveness because of the lack of experience, the lack of the doing of it, being there. Not just simply watching price. That's the first stage. Is tapering is just the first stage. Then you got to do it with a demo and submit to the idea that the rules still have to be applied. But then with live fund trading or the equivalent thereof, where you can lose something, your funded account, challenge account, your funded account, or your live account, you want to capture money. And the lack of experience that you have, and everybody has that lack in the beginning. And all of you, and I was not exempt from this, I wanted to get through that stage quickly. I wanted to leave it behind me in my, in my rear view mirror. I want to be able to say, yeah, <laughs> see you later. I ain't never going back to that town again, which is ignorance, neophyteville, beginner. Like you want to be able to leave the ranks of a, you know, a newbie. When I'm encouraging you to live there for a little while, because that's going to teach you who you are. And it's going to show you the character flaws that you have, that you're pretending you don't have, that you've been hiding from yourself your entire life. However long you've been on a spinning rock, all of you have character flaws. I don't hide mine. I don't hide it. I tell you where they are. I tell you where my weaknesses are. Because when I was a younger man, I tried to pretend they didn't exist. And they were impediments to me. They, they held me back. They were the barriers that I, hu I hugged. I held on to them. I held on to it like something wrapped in barbed wire. It's not comfortable, but you get used to that uncomfortable state and it becomes normal for you. Like that's why abusive relationships go on. Spouses that you know, beat their wives because they're weak men. That women train themselves to because they have children. They don't want to break that family up. They know what that man's doing to her is not right. But they, they allow it to go on because it becomes normal for them. And change is a little bit more scary because it begins to being in more uncertainty. And as humans, we don't like uncertainty. But in this industry, you chose to be in one that is always uncertain. There's nothing 100%. All the things that I have, all the things that I share, my track record when I pull it out and I point to something before it happens, look around. You've, you've been walking with me now for well, almost two years now publicly. How many things that I call and that happen? Very, very, very small number of that. But how many things were right and correct and where the market went to? You can't reasonably expect to be like that in the beginning. 
And when you learn from someone, when I was a martial artist, you know, I wanted to be as good as the guy that was teaching me and then better. That's what I wanted. Anything that they did that was impressive, I needed to do it better than them. Why? Because I had this deep ingrained necessity for me to be significant because while I was growing up in Cardboard City, I was part of what we considered white trash. We lived in low income. And everybody, and I got in fistfights and stomped the shit out of people that thought they were better than me. I curbed stomped people. You know what that is? Where you stomp their ass, you beat them. You drag them over to a curb. You open their mouth up with their teeth on the edge of the curb. And you stomp the back of their head. I've done that before. And the sound that makes, you'll never forget it. Those are things that I've done as a kid. With people older than me. Because they talked down to me. They acted like they were better than me. So what drives me, and still to today, is that deep scar. I was the guy on the other side of the tracks growing up. I didn't come into this world with a silver spoon in my ass. I didn't have that. Everything was a hard thing to do. And it took a lot longer than I wanted it to do. And it was very difficult. I had a lot of opposition around me. People would try to tell me, you're not going to be able to do it. You're going to just you know, amount to the same thing we do. And I went to school. And they tried to talk me out of that. And they said, you're not going to get good grades. And I got great grades. Constantly, the enemy, constantly will work on you to try to discourage you. And if you're strong enough that you have the motivation that keeps you going, when, when you're finally there, he's really going to try. Because you're, you've done it. You finally climbed to that moment where... Now you're going to see the proof. You're going to finally get that testimony that you can hold on to and say, nobody can take this from me. And some of you are going to discover that that motivation that got you there, which is everybody needs it. I'm not trying to discourage that that's a, not a, a good thing. It is a good thing. But there's an event. There's a phenomenon that takes place. Where once you're there. You can't handle the pressure and you throw out all the rules. You don't wait for the setup. You think that it's going to be stripped from you. You worked so hard to get to this moment. Now here's your first shot, the first shot to, to use the information that you've been studying. Now you can make gainful profits if it's correctly done. But you don't have the experience yet to lean on. And you see a sudden quick movement, which really isn't that much. Nothing's changed in the trade setup. But in your mind, because you're so keyed up, that motivation, you're, you're hopped up. You're ready to go. You're that guy that all your friends are around. Fight, fight, fight. When if they weren't there, you'd probably shake hands with the guy and say, you know what? You know, I apologize, man. This, this got out of hand. It's, it's just uh, forgive me for for saying whatever I said or did whatever I did to you. You can't do that now because they've incited that rage. You've become lustful for blood. You need to do this now. And something happens where that motivation becomes impulse. And you don't use your model and you press the button. As soon as the button is pressed, you're regretting it because now you just entered the uncertainty with no plan, no entry, no PDRA. You chased the price. And everything you've heard me say comes rushing into your brain and you're thinking, oh, man, this is that thing he talked about. Now that trade seems like it's going to choke the life out of you. Maybe you start hyperventilating. You don't realize it yet. So you start feeling your fingers and your hands and your arms start tingling. All of a sudden you start feeling your heart 
palpitate. Feels like you can't breathe. Doesn't feel like there's any air in the room. Why is it so hard to breathe? That's anxiety. Now you're faint. You're, you're feeling the, the effects of the adrenaline in your body. And you're standing still. It's like a Ferrari in neutral running with the accelerating pedal to the floor. It's not good for the engine. And now you're worrying about what you're feeling bodily. And then cortisol is going to release. And that hormone makes you feel like you're going to die. Now, how can you be watching price, managing it, and what you should be doing, focusing on your model, if you think you're having a stroke or a heart attack or about to pass out or throw up? I've been there. <laughs> I've been there, and I've been there while driving a truck over the key bridge in high winds, panicking because I'm watching my core track tell me that there's absolutely nothing I can do, and I'm nowhere near a payphone to get out. You can't understand that. You don't understand that. Because you're so spoiled with the information and technology we have today where we can just press a button, get in, get out. Seconds. Seconds. Be on the other side of a bridge and then someone goes and has a typical thing that anybody else would have normally. While they're doing construction on the bridge, you only have one lane, and then their engine dies. And you're on a trade. You can't get out. And you can't move. And you lose your account that day because you thought you were smart enough not to use a stop loss. And Copper said, not today. That's the stuff that I lived through that. I did that stuff. So there's a lot of people out there that'll tell you, this is where I made this much money. This is where I made this much money. This is where I made that much money. I did this. I did that. I did this. Nobody is comfortable telling you where they messed it up. They want to hide it. They want to delete it like it didn't happen. Most of my mentoring is telling you what it's going to be really like. I don't sugarcoat it. I don't pretend that I didn't come from humble beginnings where it was very hard, next to impossible, and I quit dozens of times. That's what I call it. But folks that have been around before a while just know that this meant code word for I need a break. I need another job to get some money scratched up because – I didn't have a lot of it. But that motivation that leads you to the dance and you're watching the charts, you got to guard your mind and really stick your heels in, dig them in deep and say, okay, yeah, that button's right there. I can push it. I can. I can push that button. And any time I want to push that button, it's going to get me in the trade. But am I entering the trade based on my model with the logic in mind that I'm entering in the opposing direction of where I see the profit so if i'm bullish i got to be entering when prices drops it's got to be dropping if it doesn't drop i'm chasing i can't do that you can't do that when you do these types of trades and you're buying while markets are moving away from your expected directional draw or where your limit order to take profit or parcels are number one you're going to overcome a lot of fear that most traders have because they they have confirmation bias every trader out there goes through a stage of they need to have confirmation bias they have to know that they're in the trade and they're on side then they're willing to give up a large portion of the first initial run and then all of a sudden now they have courage oh i, I know i'm right now <laughs> I'm, I'm really right now and then they chase it. And now their stop loss has to be so much larger. And while they're in that trade, it might pan out. It might go exactly where they thought it was going to go originally and probably never have any drawdown. It might be just they're buying it and it just starts running and ripping away. That's really what they want. But you know what? When that happens, it's a terrible thing because it's teaching you to do bad things and expect good results. It doesn't make any sense, right? But it, you'll convince yourself at the time that this is, this is what's right for you. 
in the, the absence and the void of any real experience, sound logic, you're going to create your own right there in the heat of the moment. And that motivation becomes impulse. And for those of you that have traded with real risk of losing something, not a demo, reset is the worst that could happen. I'm talking now, you lost your funded account. You lost your combine that you were working hard for. Traded with real money. You know exactly what I'm talking about in the dozens of times that you've been here. You have to have a model. But before that model is useful to you, you have to know what price is likely to do. What characteristics does it show? How does it, how does it behave in the morning? How does it behave in the afternoon? How does it behave in those respective sessions after a big up-close day or down-close day or an inside day? They're all characteristics that you need to study and associate with over a period of time. And you're not going to be able to do it in just a few short weeks or a couple months. It takes time. Some of you are just so willing to assume risk, hoping that you're right like a lottery win, that you throw all sound logic and reason out the window. Because you just want to have something to hang your hopes on. Because if you make a little bit of money, a little bit of money is better than what you were doing before, right? If I could just make a hundred bucks a week. Yeah, I can see that. In today's world, that, that means something. That might be your gas being covered for the week, back and forth to work. Things are expensive. When I put gas in my truck, if I drive it a lot, it's very easy for me to go through $130 a week. Eight cylinders, you know, they, they eat it. Now, I'm not worrying about that money, but I think about how it would hurt the average person out there. It's it's a lot. I mean, that's the reason why there's a lot of cars or car lots up here that have these kind of trucks sitting in their car lot in the used lot. They traded them in. They can't handle it. Too much expense. Same thing when they bought that vehicle. They were motivated because they saw their buddies have a truck. I got to get a truck too. Everybody's driving trucks. And when they bought it, because they were impulsive, they're regretting it. They have buyer's remorse. You don't want your trading to have remorse. You want to have removed any doubt that you can justify anything outside yourself as a reason why you lost. And that went over your head right now, especially the ones that want to have selective hearing. So I'm going to say it again real slow and painfully. Many of you, especially the ones that are beginning this, you're trying to do anything to get in and make money. But you're willing to ignore all sources of responsibility on yourself. But as a trader that is actively trying to pursue consistency and longevity, profitability, what you're trying to do while obtaining that as your goal, the way you get there is removing any excuse, any cause, any reason for you failing outside of your own model and your own experience. That's personal responsibility. And that's not taught in this industry. It's easy to be able to say, well, the markets are random. Well, you know, they really shouldn't offer 15 contracts. If it really isn't good for us, they shouldn't really do that. There's always excuses that the ones that are not prepared to be responsible, to be sound stewards of the money that they have in their hands, and the risk that they associate with it. I'm not going to use a stop loss because I have a point to prove. Well done, maximum loss drawdown margin call. You proved a point. Everybody knew it, but you confirmed it. That's scar tissue. Now that's going to motivate you to do stupider things. Because now you're embarrassed. Because everybody saw what we already knew. Might not be that grand of a scale of an embarrassment for you when you take your your trade. It led you up to the charts. You're there. You got all the things figured out. And you impulsively predict and anticipate the setup forming, but you want to be ahead of it because you can't weather the impatience. 
It's agony. Oh man, what if it runs without me? I, I sat here all this time. I did all that charting. I already told people I was going to be buying long and they're going to be asking me for proof. Where's the receipts? Where'd you go long? And I ain't going to be able to have anything to show them. Oh my goodness. I don't care. I, I got to get in. There you go. There you go. You did everything wrong. I don't care if your analysis was good. I don't care if your lipstick on your chart was correct. If your draw on liquidity was correct. All that. Everything you just shot at the shit with this entry. Because now your risk isn't appropriate. It's got to be larger now. You entered in the direction of the profit, which we don't do. But ICT, I watch you pyramid. Yep. And when I'm buying, I'm buying when it's going down. Every time. Think. Well, let me, let me retract that. When I'm inside of a PD array, I can accumulate a new pyramid entry there too. But I have size behind me that's already layered when I take those types of trades. Otherwise, if I don't have that, I won't. The more perfect example would be uh, my breaker. They say I'm bullish and I think prices are going to go higher. I'll annotate the chart while I'm doing the trades. And you see me recording it. I'll annotate it as a bullish breaker. And I'm entering inside the breaker. It hasn't left it yet and come back and touched it. See, that's that's the part you know. That's the easy side of it. The hard part is knowing where the market's going to go and being confident that I can enter on the breaker. And if it comes back, then I'll buy it again and add more because I'll, I'll have more to lean on, trusting that it's going to go higher so I can add more to it. But if that's my first entry, and that's not likely going to be the, the, the trade I go on. Then I'll elect to wait for it to come back to the breaker. But if I've already bought, like I bought the sell side that the breaker ran down for, I'm buying below that previous low. Then when it goes up into what you would classically identify as a breaker after it's moved above it and come back down and touching it, I'm buying it in it before it breaks above it, before it's going to retrace back again and touch it. So there's a time, there's a reason for everything I'm doing. I'm not just you know, pulling shit out of my ass just to say something or prove something that doesn't have any sound logic that I repeat over and over and over again. There's a logic behind what it is I'm doing. Everything that I do in my executions are systematic. I had to learn that through pain, loss, blowing accounts, losing lots of times, and every single time, Guess what I had before it? Right before I lost the account, before I lost the trade, before I had remorse, I had motivation. I had confidence. But that confidence and that motivation was like that guy. You're standing there. You really don't want to fight this person. Not because you're afraid that they're going to kick your ass, but you don't want to fight that person. You really don't want to be like this. Is it, it's It's not appropriate for you to be doing what you're being pushed into. And you have that circle of influence around you. Everybody's shouting, shouting, oh yeah, yeah, fight, 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 fight. When wisdom says, wait, if they want to swing on you, then you hit them in their fucking throat, grab them by their ears, drive their nose into your fucking knee, drag them down to the ground, put your knee in the back of their fucking skull and pound the shit out of them. You didn't ask for it, but you reciprocated. You invited them to walk away, they won't. Well, in trading, at that moment, especially for young men, it's, this is Sparta, bitch. I'm here now, and I don't need to wait for no setup. Front kick, boom. But you find out you're the one falling down. You're the one feeling that gut kick to the, so plexus and you can't breathe now because you push the button. You can't take it back. You can't take it back. What does that mean? You know you shouldn't have entered there. Sound logic would be, all right, this is premature entry. Just close it right now and wait for the setup. But you won't. You won't. Because the thing that pushed you into that impulsively is telling you right now, Man, I hope it keeps going up from here. I hope it keeps going up here. Please don't drop. Please don't drop. Please don't drop. When it's so much less pain and suffering 
just to close the trade and then wait for that setup. You might have a little bit of drawdown and the commission costs that you spent. Okay. But you have preserved your mental capital. The money that you're spending and potentially losing on that trade is insignificant in terms of the amount of debt that you're going to carry mentally as a trader for the rest of your career by doing that silly shit. Think about it. How many times have you been in a trade where even if it went to the worst case scenario and ran all the way to wherever your stop would have been? Would have been. Notice I said that. That's something you aren't trading with a stop loss. What's the worst that's going to happen? That loss doesn't end you. But in your mind, you've lost a limb. You've lost your, your strong arm. How else could you ever go back into trading if you lose this trade? If I lose this trade, I can't imagine ever wanting to do this again. That's the equivalent of what you're doing. But where was the motivation that led you to that moment? Right when it came to the time where you push that button, it transforms into impulsiveness. That moment, right before you take your trade, you have to really, really know what you're doing. You have to know exactly what you're doing, why you're doing it. And before you press the button to get into it, you have to know exactly where your static maximum risk is, and there must be a stop loss there. Because once you have that, see, you're, you're trying to avoid that stop loss because you're afraid it's going to hit it. Whereas a professional-minded trader, they want to know what that is so that way they don't worry about it. This is what I'm willing to lose. If I'm wrong, okay, I'm willing to take that as a loss. But you want to trade with the maximum leverage. So it makes perfect sense for you to try to avoid everything, ever getting – you'll never get stopped out. You'll never get stopped out if you never use a stop loss. You know what that is? Head and ass syndrome. Your head's too far up your ass and you can't see things properly. I'm sorry. I can't see it your perspective. I used to see it like that. I went, I went through that same thing, but I pulled my own head out of my own ass and started looking at things correctly. And some of you are fighting me on this. No, no, no. You don't get it, ICT. I'm different. I'm going to be the exception. No, you're not. You're just going to do it worse. But you'll never talk about it. <laughs> you're never going to tell anybody what you did when that would probably be the best thing for you. It disarms you. It makes you human. It proves that we are fa we're fallible. We're not infallible. Some of you think I'm infallible as a trader. Sometimes I don't do it right. Sometimes it doesn't work out where I want it to go. Like there's many instances where I've told my son, so that you know, I would like to see it do this, do this, do that. And then there it is. And we sat together and he's like, hey, but dad, it did this, 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 and you entered there and it didn't do what you thought. So how would I know that experience? And some of you don't want to hear that answer. 30 years, folks, you know, so that's a long time to be looking at stuff that's doing the same stuff all the time. You get used to it. You know with confidence that that one trade that you're looking at right now, even if it fails and the three after it fails, it doesn't change the efficacy of the model. It doesn't change you as the trader. It just means if you execute on them, you might have – Incurred loss. But are you allowing for and inviting those losing trades, those losses, to take you completely out of the model and completely away from trading and or having the ability to be solvent to trade? It's amazing how traders that get so worked up chasing other people's bullshit online, these things that people promote falsely, they don't have any evidence that they can do it. They don't talk about it before it happens. They don't use a model or an approach that is applicable or you can see being used in the executions. You don't even see their executions. They just tell you this is a trade I took. And they're using the buy and sell overlay thing on trading. View. That's not even an entry with a demo. That's just here's a trade I took. I think I got in right on here. Listen to what they say. They tell on themselves, but they're selling mentorships. That's frustrating for somebody that knows what the fuck's going on and have taught. Man, I don't know how many people, but I've taught a lot of people for free. And it's just my, my tolerance for it is gone. It's gone. 
and I don't try to influence all you in that respect. I mean, but if you're going to be trying to pay somebody for something, they better have the the goods. They better be able to prove that they can do what they're what they're claiming they can do instead of talk about something on the left side of the chart. But you all fall victim to that stuff, this image based stuff, materialistic stuff, and you resist sound logic, real money making money preservation insights that I went through this stuff. I had to lose a lot of money to learn these lessons. And I'm trying to very much remove the necessity for you to go through that same stuff. And you don't want to listen like my own kids. They don't, they don't listen. You wonder why my own sons do the things that they do. The same reason why you ain't listening to me. Just because they have my DNA in them doesn't mean that they're gonna. Oh no, we have, you know, it's a symbiotic relationship. You know, I'm I'm ICT's offspring. It's you know whatever the, you know the the main one says. All the ones <laughs> like there's this uh, relationship where whatever it's a hive mentality. The word escapes me, but it's kind of like the show, uh, The Last of Us. You know, the fungus, whatever one fungus feels or experiences, they all feel at the same time. That, that doesn't happen because they're my kids. They're discovering themselves too. And they're discovering that they're human. And guess what humans are? We're terrible decision makers. That's a skill set that has to be honed and beaten to us. As the scripture says, iron sharpens iron. Meaning, it's not going to be easy. If iron had feelings and nerve endings, it probably would be wincing when you rub it against another piece of iron. When you take that raw piece of metal and you want to forge it into a blade, what do you have to do to it? You have to harm it. You have to do damage to it. You got to take its useless edges off and make one useful edge. That edge is your edge that you're going to use as a weapon or a tool. Knife, a blade. But many of you want to go out to the market and you do all this work and, and preparation and you have this high-tech 50 caliber sniper rifle in your hands. And you show up and you're right there. You're sitting there. You're waiting for it. You're looking through your scope. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. And then all of a sudden the market starts to run. And what do you do? You reach for your fucking baseball bat and you chase it. What the hell is that? That's caveman mentality. That's not civilized. That's uncivilized. That's savagery. We're waiting for the mark. To walk into the crosshairs, gently hug the trigger, and be confident that we have executed precisely what our model is expecting us to do. We will not second guess it because we've done everything up to the point of engagement and entry. Our stop loss is there. We don't worry about it because we're comfortable with the risk. But if I'm honest, ICT, that means I can only really risk $75. Right. Exactly. That's why you're trading with a fucking micro. Okay. That's why you're doing that. It's not about how much you can make. It's a how much you can afford to lose and still stay in the game while you're learning. For the folks that says you can't make money with a micro. Oh, you can't make money with a micro account. You got to have this and that and the other thing. You are not versed in math. You have no idea. You have, rudimentary math is escaping you. Because if you can have a, a model, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be my stuff. And I'll say it again. It doesn't have to be what I teach. It could be anything out there that causes you to have a decision. If you risk very little and you're very, very good at managing money and don't overtrade, you can be profitable doing this. You're going to have a lot of losing trades, and that might not sit well with some of you, most of you. In fact, 99.9% .9 of you, whether you are a profitable student or a trader with my stuff or something else, you might be just listening to this and not even a trader. You're like, you know, I use Elliott Wave, and I've made money, and this, that, and other thing. Okay, you made money because you are able to weather the losing trades. But nobody wants to warm up to the idea that you're going to lose a lot in the beginning. You're trying to avoid that. When the whole secret is, is to do that very thing in the beginning.
because all the lessons that it teaches you removes the invitation for you to take that motivation and let it become impulse. If you have gone to the stage of now you're in that position where the trade that you're going to enter has a real risk, risk of failing a funded account or drawing down in a funded account combine or losing real money in a live account. If you got to that point and you have not, if you have not overcome this worrisome thoughts of what am I really looking for? Where should I place my stop loss? Am I comfortable with what I'm risking here? Is that stop really hard? Is it there? Is it or is it implied or a mental stop? Because they don't work. Try to use a mental stop on a CPI. You're going to be mental afterwards. You're literally going to be warped. And a real stop loss doesn't work there either. So what does that teach you? Why do I even talk about CPI? If you're not going to trade ahead of CPI, ICT, why even talk about it? Or you get the guys that, this is where the volatility is. Okay, show me trading before the CPI, getting it right. Crickets. <laughs> and the ones that try, get their asses handed to them in devastating fashion. That's, in, that's embarrassing. And some of these people, well, let's be honest, most of them that are doing those things are selling something of a course, a room, or they have their own brokerage. That's nonsensical. It's it's ludicrous to invite those instances in your trading. You want it to be boring. You want it to be where if you lose, who cares? I'm still going to do this same model on the next setup based on the logic. If the, if the trade failed here, but the overall conditions of the marketplace are as they should be still, I'm going to take the next setup. There it is. It's done. I already have it in my head. That's what I'm going to do. Unless I'm proven incorrect, and therefore I either need to move to the sidelines and wait for new information or reverse. But that's not always a reverse. In the beginning, that motivation, hey, I'm going to get in this trade, and you do it wrong. Or if you get squeezed out of the trade because you don't have a stop loss because you chased price, that pressure that you're feeling is going to make you think you got it wrong, and you'll abandon your model. And then what do you do? Become impulsive again and say, oh, I got it wrong. Not realizing that you just didn't do what you were supposed to do and wait for the setup, you'll reverse in the natural progression of the retracement that your original trade idea should have been waited for. So you did it wrong, chasing it. Then you're scared because it's retracing on you, and you reverse. And then the trade goes where you want it to go. But then here's where you lie to yourself. You know, I, I knew this was going to happen, you know, and um, the broker, they just, uh, they slipped me and I had to, you're lying. You fucking chased the price. You did it incorrectly. And then you changed your mind because you couldn't handle the pressure of the retracement because you were misplaced. You weren't offside. You had a poor entry, poor execution. You did it poorly. You should have closed the trade, sat and waited for the setup. Not make one decision incorrectly and then impulsively fix a mistake doing the opposite, where the analysis didn't say anything about that trade reversing and going lower. You have just come, you succumb to your own emotions and poor psychology that's now being stirred up because you're in the market, you chased price, and you didn't do anything, and you completely lost the plot. Uncomfortable, isn't it? It just happened to you this week, didn't it? Market went where you thought it was going to go, but you lost on your trades. I just pegged you. How do I know it? Because I did that when I was 20. I did it. Multiple accounts. Some of it resulted in losing trade accounts entirely. Do you need to lose your trades in stunning fashion or blow your accounts to learn that lesson from me? It's I would have loved to have someone explain it to me like this. I would have never looked at them and said, "Wow. Dude, you're you're you know, you're, you're talking about all this terrible stuff. Like motivate me, man." I would have never done that. I would have been like, "You know what? This is exactly what I need to hear. You're not you're not fluffing me up with some bullshit." And I hear promising me that I'm going to get rich overnight. 
You're giving me the things I have to concern myself with that I'm going to have to wrestle with. These are the real things. These are the brass tacks of trading. And it's it, when you hear it, it feels like I'm talking down to you or someone new to come here. Oh, you know, I don't want to listen to this guy. He's talking down to his students. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm talking to you eye to eye. I'm coming to where you are because I've been there. I'm not talking down to you. I'm taking myself right back to the location where you're at right now and telling you the guy that you look highly up you know, and have high regard for now. I didn't get this insight you know, by having fucking candy bars shoved up my ass, okay? It hasn't been easy. It's literally a, a war. You have to go through a lot of stuff. And books just don't make it plain enough for you. Like you have to go through it. And it's not easy. There is no shortcuts to it. It's all normal though. And the way you get through it is to get through it. And how do you do it successfully? By not having a whole lot of uh, result-oriented you know, progress in terms of a monetary sense. So remove that. Because if you can do one thing that's your cookie-cutter approach, that little thing that you do over and over and over again that repeats, what does that mean? Well, husbands and boyfriends. Or those in the culinary arts, you go down to your kitchen, pull open the drawer that has all your cookie cutters in it. Just reach in there, grab one randomly, doesn't matter which one it is. Okay. And you grab that cookie cutter in your hand, close your eyes, and then hold it in your hand and feel it. You know the shape. It's the star or it's the snowman cookie cutter for Christmas. You know, it might be the pumpkin, you know, cookout, uh, cutting, uh, cookie cutter for a cutout for and, and Halloween's coming out and Thanksgiving. All those bends and contortions in the shape of that cookie cutter. You don't need to lay eyes on that. You just know it. You know it intimately because you can feel it. You've seen it before. Why? Why are you comfortable if I was to ask you what you're holding, what cookie cutter is it? Because you've seen it before. You don't need to lay your hand, lay your eyes on it. You know if you open your eyes up, it's going to be the very thing you just said. Why? Experience. But you didn't look at it. The same thing is what you're conditioning yourself to do with this price action. You know that this, this fair value gap is going to form. It's going to fucking form every single day between 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock without fail. It will always be there. A hundred fucking percent. It's going to be there. You need not worry about it. It's going to fucking be there. I don't care if they're blowing shit up around the fucking world. I don't care if the fucking president gets fucking... COVID-26, it doesn't fucking matter. This stuff is going to keep working. It's going to keep working every fucking week, every fucking day, and it won't fucking stop. But you're not limiting yourself to doing just these things to prove it to yourself. I have literally taken you down to 60 minutes and said, see if what I'm saying is bullshit or not. And guess what? It's there every fucking day. Every day. Every day, London, pre-New York session, New York session, afternoon session, last hour trading. Come on. Listen, you don't have any excuse why you shouldn't wait for yourself to form. If you miss it, if you get a stop out or if it doesn't work for that one setup, you did it wrong. You did it wrong. Guess what that means? You have an opportunity maybe in the same day. To correct it or study it and, and build your confidence back up. But you're taking motivation and turning it into mania. I want to rush through this, learn how to do it, because I'm going to go and try to do five or six maximum funded account. And I'm going to do this and do that with the trading. And I'm going to be an overnight success. No one's going to be able to do it faster than me. I'm going to be the fastest meteoric rise in funded account trading. You're making it harder than it needs to be. <laughs> you really are. And you might get a little bit of success here and there, but you're going to go out there and flaunt it like it was the easiest thing since, you know, you know riding your bike now, which you've probably been doing your whole life. It's easy. It's like riding a bike now. And you're going to lie to yourself. You're going to lie to anybody else that's listening. Like you're, you're, you're providing all of the outside noise and justification that's not helping you. 
You're willing to go through all those things. You're willing to enter a trade when there is no setup. It hasn't formed yet. The framework is likely to be there. The draw on liquidity where it's going to go ultimately. You're in a session. It's probably going to go up there. But right now, it's running in the direction of the trade profit. You don't want to enter like that. You wait for it to draw down into a PD array or up into a PD array if you're bearish. And then by doing that, you know that there is a there, there's a range in which it's permissible. It can color outside that fair value gap to sell a little bit. But see, when you impulsively enter, what you're really doing, and this is the truth, folks, you're afraid that this thing that you're trying to do as a model is going to fail in your own hands. And you know that if it does, and you do everything that you think is correct, you're not going to stick with it. And you're going to start all over again chasing something else. And folks, I just nailed down 90% of you motherfuckers. You don't want to listen because you're afraid you're going to do it wrong. And then you're going to fault the model. You're going to fault the approach. And then you, because you're, and you're impulsive, you're going to go out there and chase Elliott waves. You're going to chase harmonic patterns. You're going to chase some other bullshit. Crazy, ain't it? How could I know this? Because <laughs> I did the same stupid shit. <laughs> I've done the same stuff, folks. You have to change your perspective. You have to be accountable to yourself. And you also have to give yourself the opportunity to do it right. And have the fruits of it. Just like when you win and you have a, a, a series of good winning trades. And it's still Tuesday. But that's not an invitation because you have Wednesday and Thursday and Friday still to trade. Well, you know, I, I, I got to push my edge into a dull, blunt fucking edge. So many times I've seen students, and I've done this before, you, know, you go in there, you get a windfall victory in the beginning of the week, much larger than you normally would. You're like, man, I'm really good at this shit. I'm going to go out there and... Uh, I'm going to impress my wife. She's finally going to realize this ain't a video game. Watch, I'm going to tell her what I'm going to do over here. And boom, boom, boom. And then there it is. You get back half of it or a third of it or worse, all of it and more. Then you go into the weekend with a loss. That is demoralizing. That sucks. That really sucks. Especially if you showed everybody online in the beginning of the week, here's what I made, here's what I made. And then they're like, um, progress report, where yet? <laughs> MIA, baby, I ain't coming on. I've, I got things to do. Radio silence. You're making it harder on yourself by doing that. So you have to you have to weigh all these things out and also provide no opportunity for them to be in the trading so it becomes less of an impact adversely. Because it's real easy to talk yourself out of this because it's hard. It's really, really hard. And what makes it hard is, is that you are equating success and failure on a personal level. Think about it. As a business, okay, think about it like this. You, you have a business and you do some kind of customer service for the biz, uh, for some for the community at large. Okay, say you run a landscaping business, okay? And I'm thinking of that now because it's raining and usually the landscaping company would be here today, but it's raining so they're, they're not able to make their money today, so I'll probably see them tomorrow. So they perform a function or a service for the community. If I say to this business owner, or the employees of it and say, hey, listen, um, your weed eater is tearing up the pillar on my pool house. I'm not making this up. This is something I'm going to be bitching about. But if I say that to this person, if I say it just to the employee, he'll just nod his head and then say, okay, sorry, you know, I'll, I'll tell so-and-so. And it's that's, that's it. Nothing's going to happen. And unless he's the person that's using the weed eater each time, it, nothing's going to change. But if I call the company... And I speak to the owner and say, hey, listen, um, this is what's going on, and I just want to bring it to your attention. Can you make sure that this doesn't continue? Oh, absolutely, sir. I apologize. We're going to take care of it. And once he's handled that situation and the uh, conversation's over, he's not worrying about me the rest of the day. He's not worrying about losing his account with me. He's not worrying about you know his future business. He's not going to start doing shit differently. He handles that matter right then and there, and it's without emotion. It's just business to him. He understands that not all customers are going to come in with a, a, a wonderful review. 
I could contact him and say, you're done. I'm going to use somebody else because this is what's going on. I just discovered it. But he's not going to stop becoming uh, or, or he's not going to stop running his landscaping company because I complained or maybe even dropped them. That's not that's not what he's going to do. Why? Because his fucking business model works. And I'm one transaction. I'm one source of a model. He knows if he comes to this property once a week and does this same thing, I will pay him. That's the result he's going to do. The same thing with your trading. You've got to treat the same way. Not every single trade is going to yield the best review. The outcome is not going to be as the favorable one. But does it take you out of reaching for that model or having faith in it being useful in the future? No, because it's just like that cookie cutter. You can't ask the cookie cutter to be a rolling pin. It's not its function. Just like you can't ask the silver bullet to be there, you know, in times where it's not favorable for it, where there's a consolidation and it's going to consolidate in Asia or after four o'clock going into five o'clock you know, afternoon in the session. The, there's, there's no, there's no silver bullet between five, I'm sorry, 4 PM and 5 PM. But the market's moving. It's it's still ticking around, but there is no setup there. I would never look at that and say, this is a silver bullet. This is a fair value gap. I would sell short or you know, go long in because of the timing of it. You're asking that model to exist in a, in a time and it's not going to be there, which is the equivalent of taking a cookie cutter and saying, I'm going to use it as a rolling pin. It won't work. It doesn't work. It's not a hammer. It's not a screwdriver, you know? But you know that cookie cutter, if you lay it into dough, okay, you take that dough and you spread it across your counter and you take that cookie cutter and you press it down into that dough that's rolled out. And you know when you lift that cookie cutter up slowly and you follow all the processes of rolling the dough out, taking the cookie cutter, pressing it down in, maybe slightly twisting it back and forth a little bit, and then slowly raising it up, you're going to have a cutout of that dough. In the form of that cookie cutter. That's what your trading model is. That's what I'm teaching you to look at. That five point run. That five handle run in S&P. Because if you can do this. If you can stick to the process of handling that cookie cutter. The fair value gap silver bullet that takes five points or five handles out of the marketplace. And you consistently are able to do that and nothing else. Guess what you're doing? You're, you're forging patience. You're forging real experience that no one can take away from you. And you're learning a lot about yourself, what you're going to be feeling. Are you feeling impulsive? Are you feeling impatient? The trade's not panning out fast enough for you. The way you go over that is by being in the marketplace, doing it. You have to engage it. And then you won't feel impulsive like, I just got in this trade 30 seconds ago. It should have already done five handles by now. <laughs> I know what it feels like. It, it, you want it to be painless, and I'm telling you it's going to be painful, but it's worthwhile. It's worthwhile doing it. It's got an outcome that is worth doing that is not 100% success, but that less than 100% success rate equates to your success ultimately. But you're trying to avoid any losing you're trying to avoid any kind of hardships or any kind of embarrassments or discoveries about yourself. And you want to not fail using it because you're weak. You're undisciplined. You have no sense of self-responsibility. And you know yourself well enough that if you fail using the model based on the rules, you're going to associate that one failure with it's ultimately sucks. It's fraud. And I'm never going to be able to do it. And I have to justify things outside myself, hold myself to no accountability. And I'll have to chase something else. And I don't want to do all that again. That's the reality folks. This is actually going to be a chapter in the book, but I wanted to say it. I wanted to say these things. Because reading it in words, it's easy to just like, okay, uh, you know, I saw the letters there. I saw all the spaces between the words, but I really didn't take anything from that. It's just filler. It's fluff. But this is the real shit, folks. This is what really goes on when you're pressing the button and it matters. This is the stuff that goes on to your, you know, your thoughts, what you're wrestling with, what you're pretending isn't there. But in reality, this is really what it is. 
if I would have titled this Twitter space, all the shit that's causing you to lose and how it's going to continue doing it. You probably wouldn't want to watch it. Probably wouldn't want to listen to it. Because you need to be you you need to be around someone like a, a Tony Robbins who wants to tickle your ass with a feather and say, hey, everything's going to be great. You're a success story in the making. Everything's great for you. You're not going to fail. Never accept failure because it's never going to happen for you. Get the fuck out of here. This guy used to be a fucking janitor. Okay, and sold all kinds of bullshit, blowing smoke up, up up people's asses, walking on coals. Yeah, you can walk on coals. Stand on the fucking coals. Then you're going to impress me. It's fucking physics. But people see that shit like, wow, yeah, it's, it's fucking something. <laughs> Furus. Meanwhile, Tony Robbins is probably unfollowing him. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that guy Grant Cardone follows me. I don't know how that happened, but if you're listening, Grant, how you doing, man? Um, the the new week that's coming. I'm going to say this, and then I'm going to close it up. When you're practicing, or when you're reading the tape, or if you're doing your demoing, or if you're going to be taking a, a, another trade that would be gainful if it was to be profitable, whether it be funded account. You know, funded account combine or live account funds. I want you to think about what I said today. I want you to take it to heart because if you start feeling that and you feel like you just want to get in there, turn the chart off. Walk away. Don't do anything. Come back to it an hour later and see what would have happened. And be honest with yourself. If you would have did the impulsive entry, how much drawdown would you have gone through? Did it did it run without having to set up form later on and still ultimately go to where your model would have said? It's going to be hard for you to do this next to impossible. But for the folks that really are here trying to learn, they want to have excellence in their executions. They want to be able to trust themselves as the trader, the operator, using the information and not be impulsive like a gambler at the casino. This is says, screw it. I got a hundred bucks left. And I'm just tired of this. Let me just lose everything. So that way I can't, I can't come back to the table now. I can't come back to this slot machine. I don't know why I can't, I, I, for life, I can never remember the name of that thing, but I got it right this time. Slot machine. You know, a gambler, they don't have control over themselves. They just, they lose themselves. And, and and I don't gamble in casinos. I've taken $100 to a casino. It was my first year anniversary. We went to Atlantic City, stayed at the Taj Mahal, not because I like Trump, but because that's we had a comp there from a friend of the family. And they let us stay in his room, and it was really nice. But I knew enough about myself that I don't want to take money there and gamble. So I said, I'll just put 100 bucks into a slot machine. And whatever happens, I don't care. And it took forever, like five fucking hours for me to lose this hundred bucks. Every time I went down, 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 I never went higher thinking like $115 is the highest it went. So my best was $15, but who's going to stop at 15 bucks, right? But for hours and hours and hours, it would drop down. I'm down to 30 and all of a sudden it up to 80, 90 bucks, a hundred bucks, maybe 102, something like that, but never went above 115. And it would drop me back down into 20s and 15, got down to like 12 one time. I was like, okay, it won't, it won't be long now. It's going to be gone. And then right on back up to the 75 and 80 hours. And I'm like, what the hell? And at this point, I'm like, man, what the shit? It's maximum bets. I want to lose this now because I don't have the discipline to get up and walk away from it. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, I might get lucky. You know, this, the three sevens might come up. You know, I might get whatever the, the machine title was thrown, you know, flashing above it. That's what happens in trading. Every single time I lost my account, it was the same thing. I would make a little bit of money. I'd lose a little bit of money, make a little bit of money, but not go back to the same equity high or the, the opening balance. And it would draw back down again. And then I'd get mad because it would just be back and forth, back and forth, just under water. And I just wanted to have that one trade to put me back above water because in my mind, I was thinking, 20-year-old, you know, even if I have... A failure here, 
I got plenty of time to make more money and, and refund it. That was my excuse. That was the insurance policy. That's bullshit. That's, that's the wrong mentality. You need to treat it like it's the only account that you're ever going to have. That means it means something to you. It's your child's education fund. When you start thinking about it like that, it ain't your girl money. It ain't your, I can replace it with something I can do over here or there. It means something to you. When you conduct it with that in mind and you are held accountable, which is real hard in this industry, because how can you be accountable to anyone that doesn't do it too? It's not like you can go to your spouse, your boyfriend, girlfriend, a family member, your coworkers and say, hey, here's what I'm doing. And I want to show you what I'm doing. And when I'm wrong, I want you to be able to say, you know, are you following the model? They want those opportunities. They want to be able to say, I told you it wasn't going to work. So you're not going to be comfortable and honest. And your spouse isn't going to see it. They're not going to see it. They're not going to believe it. They're not going to be behind you because they've never seen this before. You haven't seen it before. You brought nothing for them to feel confident about what it is they should trust. There's no evidence that what you're doing is a worthwhile investment and you're trying to risk money. It seems like gambling. It seems like nothing more than going to a casino. So they're not going to support you. They're not going to be a, a means of holding you accountable in a, a realistic manner without being too judgmental. So you have to do it. You own all this responsibility. You're the CEO. You're the CFO. You're the manager. You're the employee. You're the HR department. You're all of it. And when you fail... You failed. Not the model. Not the broker did it to me. You did. You did. When I lost my accounts, it was every bit of my responsibility. At the time, I was looking for every possible way where I can justify it somebody else's fault. Because I was angry. And I was angry and ignorant at the same time. And that's a terrible combination, especially today, where we have access to people's time, their eyes reading tweets and bullshit that's you know posted directly to them because they wouldn't say that shit if it was in front of them. People all, and people have bravery today because they're separated by thousands of miles. And they think anonymity protects them. But that same kind of shit wouldn't fly in the streets. Get your fucking card punched real quick. But you invite social media. You invite toxicity. And all of those effects you're inviting at the time of your trade. You don't realize you're doing it, but you are because you're in a hurry to have something to be able to to share and champion online. Because in your mind, before you get these wins, before you get this profit, you're saying to yourself, I want to have this so I can go online and share it with ICT and he'll retweet it. Or I want to be able to share this with the people that I'm in a community with. And they're going to be able to say, that's awesome. I saw so-and-so he did or she did this today. And you'll be a sense of encouragement to someone else. And that then therefore makes you significant. But you're already significant. You're a work in progress. But you're looking for outward signs of significance versus you having comfort in your own skin, knowing that what you're about to do is what you always will do. You're not reinventing the wheel. You're not trying to do something new. You're not letting the motivation become impulse. You're carrying the motivation to execution. Execution, execution. It's about that. That's the process. That's the model. It's about following the fucking rules. And if you do that by default, you will get the results you're looking for. But if you don't do those things and you include outward opinions or being led to do things for the purposes of being able to show somebody else that you did something, you want to prove somebody wrong. You want to prove somebody inferior to your ability to trading. You want to prove that your method is better than their method. My method, it's yours and back and forth bullshit. I went out there this week cautious. 
told you, you know, it's in the morning session, one of these, I can't remember what it was, but um, there was nothing algorithmic in the morning session. It was all manual intervention. It was back and forth. None of the PD arrays were supporting it. It really wasn't running for liquidity. It was just painting back and forth, up and down, up and down, that seek and destroy. If I trade that, I will have my ass handed to me. So I cut bait. I'm going to wait for something that makes sense. I told you I would rather see it do this, reach up to this specific buy side liquidity. And above that, there is a range, these very specific levels. I want to see it go up there, and then I believe that they'll drop it lower. Off by one tick. Yesterday, beautiful execution. Beautiful execution. But it's in a week where what I just described and explained to you, this is the number one reason why, okay? This is the absolute number one reason why I don't sit down with you live and go through the motions of doing this. Because many of you have confirmation bias. Like you have to have confirmation that if I say I'm doing something or if I take a trade and I enter it live, and I'm talking about if I use a limit order where you can see that order is resting before the market gets there, you all could potentially copy that trade. But not all of you will. Some of you are going to be, well, a little skeptical. Not in the sense that I might not be able to do it right, but you need – because you're going to be risking your own money. That's exactly what you want to do. You want to be able to copy what I'm doing. And the ones that won't take the actual orders, you're going to wait and see if it starts moving in the direction I think it's going to be. So my order would be filled. I'm already in profit. It's running towards my target. Then you would do what I'm explaining here. The motivation for you to want to take the trade, now you become impulsive, and you'll chase it. And what will happen is exactly what the fuck happened on Internet Relay Chat back in 2000 and 2001, where I was hosting a chat room. I was literally calling the S&P. I was telling everybody what my orders were, where my stop were, where my target was. I was doing that. And I had people saying, I lost fucking money following you today because this, this, and this. Okay, show me your fills. Six and a half, seven fucking handles past where my order was. That's not following me. That's chasing me when I'm already winning. And in social media, people have a tendency to be able to bitch online about things that are absolutely 100% their fucking fault. And then people that don't know the, any better just show up like a like a car driving by a car car accident. They're turning their heads, you know, rubbernecking. Oh wow, what's going on? Oh, this guy said this, 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 and he apparently he must not be able to trade because that person followed him and they lost money. When the details are, my trade worked out fucking perfectly, and you didn't do anything right, and you chased something, and now you're pissed off because you wrecked yourself. You didn't listen. You didn't even use the model. You just chased something. You think, okay, it's finally proven to me that it's going to keep moving. And then you got sucked into the drawdown. That's natural. It didn't reverse. But you can't handle it because you don't know how to trade and you didn't do anything in the model. You're just impulsively chasing price. And because human nature being what it is, you, like anyone else with a weak mind, would say, well, it's not my responsibility. I didn't lose money. You, know, you caused me to lose money. Well, I didn't push the fucking button, bitch. You did. You did that. And I have students in my mentorship that in every intake, some of them tried to do that shit. And I said, uh, show me where I told you the entry uh, pattern was. Where was the entry price on it? Where was the stop loss at that you employed? Where did you hear me say that? Didn't happen. But it went to where I said it was going to go. You are to study which one of these PD arrays do you see continuously occurring. Whenever I point to something in the price delivery, this is where I think it's going to go. And it runs there. When you observe and you study price action, what are you seeing? Because not everybody's going to see a fair value gap. Not everybody's going to see a mitigation block. Nobody's going to see no, – well, not, not everybody, but everybody isn't going to see a breaker. 
the one that jumps off at you that you're just able to see right away, real quick and easy. That's the one you start with. Because you're all going to learn from that one foundation how you can apply every PDA right after that. But you got to get good at one of them. How's that possible? Because you're all doing the same damn thing. The market's going to go to liquidity or inefficiency. And you have to have experience working towards getting that goal as a skill set that you can lean on. If I'm 100% confident that I know which side it's going to go for, buy side or sell side, whether it be in the form of inefficiency or actual liquidity below or above highs, whichever those two instances are, whatever I settle in on and I'm confident with it, when I show you my pyramids, when I'm building up a position, I'm literally trading every fucking PD array that's forming from the time I get in the trade until it gets to 50% of the range that I'm expected to see pan out. Then I can't do any more pyramid entries. But I'm literally trading every fucking PD array just to prove it and stick it in the asses of everybody there that doubts this stuff ain't really there. I do that. And any one of those pyramid entries could be your unique entry model. It's not, it's not selling the idea that that's better than the, 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 the other ones that I've taken. Any one of those can be what you're looking for, but does it resonate with you? And what happens is when I do this, you all want to just go out and say, I want to be able to do that. I want to do eight entries and capture this big run up, full pull. That's what I mean when I say I'm not the best mentor because I don't always have the best way of teaching. The, the methodology that I'm trying to employ, teaching a concept, many times gets lost in translation. And that's why sometimes you'll say something to me that otherwise, you know, it's a really nice opinion of me. It might be, you know, a high remark, but I won't like it because you got something from something that I wasn't really aiming for. And I don't want to encourage you to see something that really wasn't my intention at all. So it, it, it's a very difficult thing for me to be a teacher doing this because it brings with it. I mean, if you were all honest, if you were all honest and you were 100% responsible, I would want nothing more to be able to say out here and say, okay, this is what we're going to do. But but you you see people out there talking bullshit now. <laughs> they're talking bullshit. I'm out here proving it every fucking week, and they're making up shit. It's laughable. It's literally laughable. But that's human nature, and things are getting tightly wound up, and people are getting really emotional. They're lashing out, and they want every opportunity to find an outlet. Let me plug into whatever's available so that I can release my hostility. I'm not going to be that for you. You're a fucking failure because you're a fucking failure. When I failed, it was my fault. When I succeeded, it was because I stopped thinking like a dumbass. Stopped doing dumb shit. Stopped inviting outward influences. And me being impulsive, I had to wrestle that stuff. I had to subdue it, overcome it, and make no allowance or invitation for it. That's what I'm talking about. It's why it's going to take you longer. Perfect example. That, that's why I like that guy, Patrick Whelan. You know, he tweeted, like, why am I? I think he's being facetious to the people that, that follow me. He's having fun with all you. <laughs> you get two team mentality. And you try to defend me. I, I don't see anything that he's doing. I think he's funny. But uh, I like watching him because he's a case study in everything I'm talking about. He shares his frustrations with his shortcomings. I wish I could just hold on to these runners. I know if I get out of this trade, it's going to. He's literally a case study for you to see exactly what I'm talking about. And if you apply the things I'm talking about as a solution, and did it openly in front of all of you, not only would he get over what he's having an issue with, he'd be able to hold the trades longer and he had these big windfall victories. He'd have more payouts. His audience would grow by default. He would be a bigger, well, celebrity in the trading circle. He'd have more followers on his YouTube channel. He had more ad revenue. People would probably be more inclined to buy whatever he's selling. And for the folks that view him as toxic, if they was able to be more consistent about taking these big runs, they wouldn't talk so much about that. And I'm convinced that the people that bitch about him most 
are the people that try to follow what he's doing. Exactly what I just said in this Twitter space today. They're chasing something and they wreck themselves and they want to use him as a catalyst. Just like they use me and any other mentor or teacher out there that's going to be able to be faulted for something that they themselves done themselves. And I'm sorry, but I'm going to call bullshit. It's bullshit. Because as a 20-year-old, I did the same damn thing. Okay? I blamed Larry Williams for every fucking account that I blew after I learned some of his shit. I blamed that man, and he didn't tell me any fucking thing. Well, let me retract that too. Sorry. <laughs> I did subscribe to his S&P alert thing where you, you called a 900 number, and he would say, okay, this is the, the picks for tonight. I'm watching this. I'm going to be buying you know, this many uh, points above the opening price, so he's buying strength. And I'm going to try to do this, do this, and I'm going to use a $2,600 stop loss. So he's risking $2,600 to do this, whatever this trade was. And I never made money using that stuff. And I did use what he was telling as an entry and a stop. I did all those things, and I never saw a winning trade. So I stopped it. Would I have eventually had a winning trade? I don't know. I didn't stay with it long enough. Oh. So I did exactly what I said to you, what you're going to do. System hop. You're going to jump around. So he may have had some stellar wins, but I wasn't willing to stick with it longer than a week and a half because I had to pay for that stuff. So if I got to pay for it and it's not making me money, why am I going to keep doing it? Right. So here I've removed every excuse for you. I've taught for free, openly, publicly. I've literally laid my mentorship in your fucking hands and said, shoot holes through it. See if it doesn't work. People that have done it, guess what? They're fucking making real money. Some of them are making more money than you make in a year in withdrawals. I have students that are just about to cross over to the real one millionaire status. How many mentors out there are doing that? How many mentors have you seen make millionaires with trading for fucking free, <laughs> for free, for free? There's none of them out there. None of them. You're listening to them. And that's why everybody fucking hates me that sells something because I'm tearing down their shit. I'm not actively trying to do it. I'm not trying to victimize any one of you, but the industry needs this. I'm a fucking enema. And I'm flushing all the bullshit out of this place. I'm the one doing it. Nobody's doing it with me. I'm the one that came here with the cure. I came here with honesty. I told you when I first learned how to do this shit, I was fucking clueless. I changed and contorted everything. I abandoned this and abandoned that. And I had it in year three, almost three and a half years. I had it. But I tweaked and messed around with it for another year or two years going on six year uh, that's when i knew what i was looking for so it's not easy to find yourself and some of you may hear that and think Man, i'm not doing this for six years i need to work right now you're gonna fucking fail you just said i have to do this for six years or i'm never gonna be able to make money no i'm saying with that mindset you're gonna fail because I subscribe to the idea wherever I got to go in this, as long as I arrive in 20 years, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. If I'm there in 20 years where I don't have to have a job, I'm a success. So I made a lot of room for taking a lot of time, making mistakes, learning a lot about shit that I thought I was going to learn real quickly, but discovered. I was on the right track by like having a broader horizon for me getting to what would be considered success. I don't want to spend a year learning how to do this. Ain't no way I would do six years and not be able to find consistently profitable. No way. No, way. Uh -uh, I can't do it. But you'd be willing to go to college for four years with no guarantee of a job and go into hundred thousand dollars of fucking debt. You're willing to go through some kind of trade school bullshit program with no guarantee that you're going to be able to make a living doing that job or be good enough to be gainfully employed just because you got a certificate. Nothing's guaranteed, folks. 
So it's easy to talk yourself out of this. And if you allow your friends and your family and influences and social media, the pattern, what it is that you should have and subscribe to as a mindset, you're fucked. I felt that. I went through that at 20 years old. It's human nature to be like that. But you're running your own company here. Some of you are just about to start your own enterprise, your own business, your own empire. And you're letting the fucking opinions of maggots and shitholes tell you what you're going to be doing to be successful. And they're living in their mother's fucking basement. They just graduated high school two years ago. And you're letting their opinion about you and what you should be doing. You're listening to that. A bunch of text on a post where some fucking clowns making videos talking about something that everybody sees working. That's that's insanity. But that's also these same people that are failures. They want to hurt something that's hurt them. They can't rise above what I put out there that you're all having for free. For free. With the receipts that it fucking works with real money, with demo, in my hands or out of my hands, other people all around the world, different walks of life, different age brackets, different sexes, different whatever the fuck it is. Diversity. The people that come here and want to learn how to do this stuff, they have no excuse why they can't leave with knowing something that can change the trajectory of their financial future. You have no excuse. None. I teach you how to do it properly. I tell you it's going to take a little bit longer than you want it to be, but it's normal. Don't, don't be afraid of that. Take notes when you watch the videos. So that way you don't have to come back to that fucking video and give me more ad revenue. Don't buy my fucking books. There's, I mean, come on. I'm stopping at the height. All this bullshit that they're going to try to tell you. If I'm in here to rook you from, I could literally do it right now. You would gladly fucking send me money. I don't want your fucking money. You worry about all the wrong shit and just, just listen. Just put the work, all the effort into things that you're trying to combatively fight against. Take that energy and turn around and say, okay, let me just put it into this. I had so many trolls on baby pips that are now profitable, consistently profitable fucking traders using my stuff. You know what they learned? The free shit right up there on 2022. I was one of the guys on Baby Pips that talked shit about you, man. But I got to be honest with you. What you just showed, I, I was wrong. Thank you. I wish you luck. Let me know what you keep doing with it. I'm not here to be the villain. I'm not here to hurt anybody. If you sell something, if you sell education, if you're selling signals, how's it going to hurt you if you use the information I'm making available for free and it makes you better? And then your, your customers don't even need to know. They don't even need to know that you use my shit. I'm looking out for your customers more than you are. But you're not going to undermine anything I've already done. It's already done. It's already done. It's already in motion. People already have it in their hands. They can't forget what's already been taught. And they can fucking make money with it. There's nothing anybody can do. Nothing. All that drama, all that fucking wasted energy. Look around, man. Shit's getting fucking hard. And you got time to be doing this dumb shit? Arm wrestling somebody else? Trying to get me to fucking trade in your fake fucking brokerage account. Get the fuck out of here, man. Get out of here. Trade in a real fucking account where it's third-party audited by the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Then people will take what you're saying with a little bit more weight. White label fucking brokers is bullshit. Watching people lose ninety thousand dollars in a fucking a minute or two, and they ain't got no issue, no, no issue at all. That's how you know it's fucking demo. If they're smiling about it, it's fucking fake. Okay, it's fake. If I'm dropping ninety grand, I'm gonna feel that. I'm gonna feel it. I'm not gonna be sitting there staring into the fucking webcam like, oh yeah, oh, it's something. Here. Yeah, it's horseshit. That's fucking bullshit. But hey, you know, everybody's got their own fucking way of getting their audience. But I want you to understand something. The greatest testimony that I don't need to fleece anybody 
is me leaving at the highest point. I'm not going to sell you nothing. I'm not telling you to buy my books. I'm only writing them so that way my stuff is in print correctly. And nobody can say it was not explained and that I didn't author it and I gave it to you all. I'm not going to make it an expensive book. It's going to be reachable for all of you. And I didn't know that the ones that are out there with low income conditions, they're all going to go out there and they're going to fucking scan it and they're going to share it on Telegram and you're all going to get it for fucking, fucking free. So I'm not doing it for money. I don't give a fuck about that. You're all waiting for that to happen because you're going to sell $5 editions of it. <laughs> Once they're in print, I'll fucking put them on my fucking website for free. I just want them with the you know, ISBN number. It's, it's mine. It's printed. I don't need your fucking money. I'm not in need of you paying my fucking bills. I'm not in this for clout. I'm not in here to be worshipped. I'm leaving the king. I'm stepping off this fucking throne. Nobody dethroned me. No one pushing me off of social media. I fucking am leaving. Because I need to. My family is requiring me to do this. But none of you have an excuse. You have no justification or any real reason why you can't take this information and make money with it. It's costing you nothing. And everything that everybody's ever fucking said about me, I've proven is total fucking bullshit. Ask anybody right now that is selling shit or trying to grow their audience and have a little fucking check mark on fucking Twitter. Count how many people are in my audience right now listening to this Twitter space with a fucking check mark. I don't have no check mark. I'm not trying to make money off of engagements. My videos are monetized because if I didn't have them monetized, YouTube would be getting fucking sixty thousand dollars a fucking month in their pocket. And for what? I'm not in there. I'm not in there to make them fucking money. Some of you people with the biggest opinions are financially illiterate. You talk like you understand something, but you know nothing. Ask these people that are trying to sell their bullshit, their Mickey Mouse programs, their mentorships. Ask them when they're going to stop. Ask them. They're going to ban you. They're going to block you. I'm the ticket right now. I'm it. And I'm leaving because I want to go back to my regular life. Because I don't need this. I don't need to be doing this. I, in four or five, you know, like four or five weeks or so, what's it, 28 days? I will have accomplished what I set out for. That's it. My wife's made an allowance for, I can do something once a week. And to be quite honest with you, I don't know how I want to do that. And I might not do it for a while. But I'm not going to be engaging on Twitter. All my videos will stay up. All the tweets will be here. No editing. Nothing. It'll be just like I left it. And I want you to think, who else with this much influence, this much open checkbook, all I got to do is put a price tag out there, and you're all going to send it to me. Who else would do this? Who else really needs the money? Who else needs the attention, the adornment, or worship that you all pretend that I, you think I need that? I don't need that. I can't wait to put down Inner Circle Trader. I've carried this moniker too long, and I've allowed it to define who I am, and it's not who I am. I am the guy that talks in those other Twitter spaces. Trading brings out the bad stuff in me. It makes me highly competitive. It makes me want to prove all the time when I don't need to prove shit. The chances of you Velcro ball motherfuckers out there that talk all that shit of going into the Robins Cup next year, nil. But I'll come in that motherfucker. You get on that leaderboard, go on the number one spot, and you call my motherfucking ass out. And I will go in there and roast your ass and never tweet one about it. 
won't even mention anything about it. I'll just walk that shit dry. And then my banner, uh, that, that banner on my YouTube channel will be the fucking little statue they fucking give you. And I'm not going out to Chicago so they can interview me and take pictures of me and then present me with it. They can just fucking mail it to me. You want to make a name for yourself? Do that. That's how you do it. Talking shit doesn't do it. Because there ain't nobody in this industry causing this much fucking waves, making this many fucking testimonials with real fucking money, people making real money, lives being really fucking changed, and they just now I'm going to stop. Greed would tap them on the shoulder. Greed would cause them to sell everything, put a price tag on everything. And I've never wanted to do that. I never really wanted to do it. But people started selling my shit. And I got a fucking case of the ass. I got mad. And, you know, it is what it is. And then when the people inside that mentorship were selling it, I was like, I'm feeding them still. And I've made millionaires in Africa. They're rich because they sold something that's mine. Because it was easy to do. And it, it takes away... It takes away from the, the joy of having shared it when someone else has prostituted it, when it was never given for the purpose of selling it. And worse, not even crediting me. So I'm not going to be regretting November 12th, waking up that morning, knowing that I made my last post at 11.59 Eastern Time on Twitter. I, I'm not, I'm not going to regret that. And there are going to be people years from now, months from now, they're going to bullshit and say, this is what took place. This is, They ran him off of Twitter. Like they said, they ran me off of uh, baby pips. They didn't run me off of fucking baby pips. Baby pips would love me to fucking come back over there. They would love me to fucking go back over there. No. They didn't run me off of shit. I took my shit down because one moderator over there falsely accused me because they said my ISP address was associated to some other account over there. I have one fucking account. One. Look how many people try to pretend to be me here. I've had my computers hacked. My Instagram I just created, they, they hacked that and started directly messaging. As soon as someone follows you and they have my name or my moniker, that's not me. I follow nobody. None of you know what the fuck you're doing as far as I'm concerned. So I'm not following you. If I watch you, it's because there's a reason why I'm using you for sentiment or I like you as a person I want to watch to see you grow. But I'm not learning from anybody online about trading. But they started selling, trying to get people to buy their master class. Get the fuck out of your master class. And then people were reporting it and they shut it down. And I tried just to, to pull up somebody's link that they shared is, hey, have you seen this before? And it was a weight training Instagram account. So I was going there for a trading and I realized that I couldn't sign on. It says, your, your account's been locked due to community guidelines. Pretend to be somebody else. How the fuck am I going to be pretend to be somebody else when it's me? I had the link on my YouTube channel proving that it's me. But someone hacked it and started pretending that I'm selling something. When the first tweet, look at my tweet that's pinned on my Twitter profile. I'm not selling you anything. I'm not charging you anything. There's not going to be this return. You know, in 2025, ICT ran out of fucking money, Astro Effect style. No, I'm not doing any kind of fucking bullshit like that. I'm done. Like, I'm done. But I want to be able to come back into the community and, and just visit as just Michael, not Inner Circle Trader. Not trying to be better than the next guy or you know talk some shit about somebody else's stuff. I don't care. That's not what I'm here for. I don't want that. And I just think that, you know, I've shared enough and, and turned enough people into profitable students that are able to do this independently because 
understand this. Everybody that has these withdrawals in their live account and or funded accounts and have been interviewed and you see them proving it with receipts. I'm extremely proud of them. I don't care what the denomination is, how much you pulled out. If you're doing it and you learn from me, I'm so proud of that. Because you did it on your own. I didn't tell you when to get in. I didn't tell you when to close the trade. And anybody on the outside looking in, they have to deal with that because it's transferred knowledge. You learned. And now you're independent now. We don't have a symbiotic relationship, and I'm proving it when I cut it off. Some of you are scared, like, I'm not going to be motivated. This is what's going to have you turn back to yourself to be motivating yourself. I've talked enough about this in Twitter spaces, and people have put it on YouTube. Go find them. My whole core content, I'm teaching you things that's going to be impactful. Not just about the source material that I'm talking about in the, in the discussion, but relating things that's going to come up using that information. You want to learn that stuff. That's the stuff that matters more. They're the, they're the answers to the questions that you have not come up against yet. But because you're too new, and most of you that are young and, and male, you're too fucking stupid to know better. You don't know that you're going to end up in that situation. But I've already gave you the solution. I've already gave you the coping mechanism to replace that thought process with something more appropriate that el eliminates that problem. But, but for the folks that are smart enough to know that I'm giving you the answers before I ask you the questions, before the market demands an answer to that question from you personally, it's advantageous for you to consider how you might react in those, cir in those circumstances. But as a 20-year-old, I didn't think like that. And you're not thinking like that now either. So you have to, you have to take what I'm sharing and weigh it out. It's not filler. This, these things right here, I'm talking to you on a fucking Saturday, they're not monetized. I'm not making anything out of this. Nothing. Other people are monetizing them on their YouTube channel, and I don't give a fuck. I'm telling you what it is that you need to know. I'm guiding you. I'm teaching you from real world experience where I've hurt myself financially. I've taken accounts to zero, not doing the things I'm telling you. This is what I've learned not to do anymore. And this is what I've changed my perspective and what I learned from this experience. So that way you don't have to go through it. Why would you want to shun something like that away? Like, why would you want to discount that? That's value. That's wisdom. That's costing you nothing. And just because you haven't experienced these circumstances yet, you will. And if you don't know how to deal with it, you're going to wreck yourself or talk yourself completely out of it. And you'll stay working at Jiffy fucking Lube, you know, changing oil and maybe looking for a different job at Walmart you know, months later. Doing routine, mon mundane, little bullshit ton of jobs, never really amounting to anything and always in lack. I did that same shit. Almost 30 jobs. Almost 30 of them. Bouncing around trying to figure out what the hell I wanted to do. This is what I was made for. And the proof of it is I've turned other people into profitable, consistently profitable traders. And I'm extremely proud of all of you, and I'm extremely thankful that the Lord has given me the opportunity and the skill set to be able to transfer it to you. And while I'm at this peak, to cancel any final argument about it, it's perfect timing. Because if it was in it for me to market something, sell something to you, it, do the math. I can do it easily. And you wouldn't even think bad about it because I've said in the past, I'm, I'm never going to do mentorship. If I said, I'm starting one right now, you'd forget I said that. You're like, I'm glad he's doing it. Here's my money. Teach me. Show me. But there isn't any of that coming. I don't want to deal with that anymore. I don't need money. I don't need you to tell me I'm good or my stuff works. I'm convinced of it already. I don't need that. I want you 
to use it and feel confident using it and then share with me what you're doing with it. That's all. You know, if you're writing books about my stuff, just credit me. Don't be like Jonathan Flood. Fucking bullshit artist. Plagiarized and falsely attributed everything that he talked about in that book. That was my mentorship. And when I caught his ass out, he quit. And his middle finger to me was to write that book. And that's why I'm in his reviews telling everybody that's bullshit. Go to my YouTube channel. You'll see it. That's a clown. That's an asshole cloud chaser. They're going to be writing books about what I've taught forever now. The only thing I've asked was just the credit. So when people go to me, they'll hear me credit the Lord. That's what I want. That's what I want. I'm leaving in the perfect position where anybody else would be marketing out their ass to try to get money from everybody. I don't want it. I don't need it. And it's proof I don't need it. I can't wait to not refer to myself as three letters anymore. I can't wait until I'm not the person everybody's bringing up all the time. I can't wait. It's uncomfortable. I like this medium because I'm talking in a setting where I'm constantly reminded I'm in, I'm in the room by myself. I'm introverted. I'm not, I'm not a person that would be all that outward. You come fucking with me, I'm going to stomp your fucking ass. But normally, I'm not going to be very forthcoming. I'm going to be reserved. I'm going to be the person that talks the least in the room. But we're talking about something I feel I have a little bit of authority in. I have experience that some people don't have. I have insight that nobody else has. And I have the largest student base now that are bringing the receipts, proving it works. And they have the respect and consideration and character to be able to say thank you appropriately. That's awesome. That's awesome. I mean, that, those things are treasures to me. Every single time you guys share what you've done and your results, I screenshot them. I screenshot them and I email them myself. I have a scrapbook of that stuff. And I've literally, you know, in, in tears of appreciation and enjoy the people that have done face videos and they, they made it private. Some of the people have done it publicly, but they gave in their own testimony of what they did with the information and how it impacted them and what they're able to do now and to be able to see them and, and watch their face as they start talking about how they're transformed now and they're able to do things that they couldn't do before. And they feel so much more plugged in. In a world that really is hard to be in now, they feel accomplished. They feel like they're on the right track. They feel like they're exactly what they were supposed to be here for. They're, they're a success. They don't have any doubts about what they're doing and it's going to fail in the future. What happens if this stuff's working? They don't think that way. And to watch their, their face light up and not, their eyes really come to life when they start talking about how it feels for them now. That's overwhelming for me. And that's a treasure for me. That beats any amount of money that any of you would ever be able to send to me because I changed that person's life. And now they're convinced that they're absolutely going to be able to go forward with that skill set. doesn't mean they're going to not have losing trades. It just means that they're confident that they have a skill set, like riding a bike. I haven't been on a bike in a couple months now, but I'm quite fucking certain that I can get on that bike and ride it. It's a skill set that I have. Now, can I do all the BMX tricks and shit like I did when I was a teenager? Hell no. I'm not even going to try a bull hip out, right? <laughs> but to see individuals literally show their hearts and their appreciation, and they don't have to. You know, I get lots of emails I have never been able to get to because there's so many of you. I got letters. I got boxes of letters. 
literally that I, I don't have time to open up packages. You don't need to send me gifts and stuff like that. I know you all, you, you have my address. And if you've been waiting for November to come and you're going to send me some stuff, please, you don't need to do that. I, I literally am running out of space and I don't want to be running storage places. Just the, the store shit that people are sending to me. <laughs> okay. Just tell me, thank you. Give me a, a, a video that you made private on YouTube and just tell me, you know, what you want to say. Cause believe me, I watch all of that. I watch it and I'll comment and you know, you'll see that I saw it and I'm just very appreciative of it. And my wife and I are, are very blessed to be able to see the impact that the Lord's allowed me to have in other people's lives. And I'm very, very honored to be called your mentor. And it's been my pleasure. It's been my honor. I've had so much fun doing it. And I'm anxious to see who comes after me. That's 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 what my interest is in, because it's going to be one of you. It's going to be one of my students is going to come up. And they're going to be the next person that everybody looks to. And it's my hope that they conduct themselves with character, not arrogance, and does it better than I did. So I'm not sure if you got anything out of this one today, but I feel clean. <laughs> I'm going to enjoy the rest of the day today. And so I'll talk to you next time. Be safe.